In ChatGPT, give credit card advice. Hi, my name is Sherwin, part of the Credit Card BS podcast. Today, my co-host Sean is out of town. He's busy traveling today. So we're just going to find out by ourselves if I can use AI to replace him. Now, in all seriousness, this is just a fun little experiment to see if the information about credit card points, miles, travel, etc. on ChatGPT or other large language models is useful and accurate. So first, we're going to try it with some questions that people frequently ask me to see if I can recommend this as a useful tool for beginners to learn about credit cards. So I'll share what the chatbot says. I'll tell you my thoughts on it, if I agree or if I would give different advice. And then we're going to put it to the real test. I'm going to tell ChatGPT my current credit card situation and strategy and see if it can recommend me my next credit card. Now, quick disclaimer, I'm not using AI or asking AI for financial advice, and I'm not recommending that anyone use it directly to help make financial decisions. Now, let's get started right away. So one of the most common questions I get asked um, is how do I get started, right? What is the best credit card for beginners? And you know, even what is the best travel card? So I started with a question, um, what's the best credit card for a beginner? And it actually spit out three different suggestions. I'm going to go over them. So first, it recommended the Discover It Secured Credit Card. Interesting choice. Uh, it also recommended the Capital One Platinum Credit Card, which was surprising to me. And then it recommended the Pedal Two Cashback or No Fees Visa Credit Card. Now, none of these three credit cards would be what I would recommend to beginners. Uh, let's kind of talk through them. Okay, so first it recommended the Discover It Secured Credit Card. Now, secured credit cards, the way it works is you sort of put down a cash deposit, which then becomes your credit line. And it's super useful for people who might not have good credit or established credit, but still want access to credit so that they can improve their credit score. And it's kind of a zero risk way for a bank to lend you a line of credit because they could always take your deposit if you don't pay your bills, for example. So, you know, for people who are completely new to credit, you know, I think secured credit cards can be a good option. However, I would also recommend um, that you consider some different options. So if you're a student, oftentimes you may be eligible for student credit cards. Even if you do not have any existing credit history, they kind of understand this and is part of their marketing. So student credit cards can be a good option. Discover it has one. Um, and I would say that Discover Student Credit Card, which has the 5% rotating categories, um, is much more of a lucrative long-term you know, card than the Discover it Secured Credit Card, which only offers 2% back at gas and restaurants and 1% on all other purchases. Capital One also has other good student cards that uh, whose reward structure parallels you know, um, their paid credit cards. And also, uh, the other option I recommend looking to is this newer card called the Chase Freedom Rise. And what I like about it is essentially they'll approve you for it, even if you don't really have credit history, as long as you open a checking account with Chase and deposit, I think, at least $500. Um, so it can be a really good way to get your foot in the door of Chase, which has a lot of lucrative cards that you can get down the road. And I would also recommend that for your, like your first credit card, you get something that you know, can be converted into something that you might use more in the long term. For example, Chase Freedom Rise can become a Freedom Unlimited, um, which offers 1.5x points, which are ultimate rewards points, which can be used for travel, right? So even that first card is kind of part of your strategy. Whereas if you get, you know, some crappy card, like what Chappie GPT is recommending, the Capital One Platinum credit card, for example, um, you know, that those rewards don't really transfer over in the long run. So my overall assessment with this answer is I'm not super impressed. I can see why secured credit cards can come to mind. We're talking about beginners, but there are really a lot of other good options. So I'm going to rate this one a fail. Um, I also asked ChatGPT what is the best travel credit card. This is sort of a trick question to see what it would do, because in my opinion, there's no best travel credit card. There's so many different credit cards that have pros and cons. They fill in different gaps. They have different use cases. Um, and you know, one card might be super useful for someone, but completely useless for a different person who has completely different travel habits. So even if you asked me what is the best travel credit card, I probably wouldn't give you 
a good answer. Um, I guess ChatGPT sort of picked up on this principle because it recommended three cards. Uh, the Chase Sapphire Preferred, the Capital One Venture card, not the Venture X, but the $95 Venture card, and the Amex Gold card. Um, I think this is sort of a mixed bag. Let's start with the second one, actually, the Venture card. The Venture card is pretty solid for a $95 card, I think, because it offers 2x points on all purchases. Those points are transferable, and lately they've had decent sign-up bonuses. But I would argue that the high-tier Venture X card a $395 annual fee, although it has a little higher fee, it's actually going to be worth it for more people uh, because each year the Venture X automatically gives $300 in um, uh, in their travel portal credit um, as well as 10,000 anniversary points, which is worth at least 10,000 points. So it automatically already pays for itself and it gives you Priority Pass Lounge Network access. Whereas the $95 uh, credit card, although it's a lower fee technically, there's no tangible credits to offset that fee. So I would argue it has a higher effective annual fee than the Venture X. So that would be my qualification to ChatGPT's answer. I would probably recommend the Venture X over the Venture card. And I also recommended the Chase Sapphire Preferred card and the Amex Gold. I have mixed feelings about these cards. I do think the Sapphire Preferred is a good stepping stone for many people to get into um, unlocking more travel, uh, uh, more travel benefits for their chase points, especially because it is the lowest fee card you need to be able to transfer points to transfer partners. Um, however, I do prefer the, the chase ink preferred from the business side. Usually it comes with a higher bonus. Um, and also Sapphire preferred does not offer any really good recurring tangible like credits to offset the fee. You kind of sort of just have to keep it or keep at least one Sapphire or ink preferred card. Um, so that you can transfer points out. So that, that's kind of my take on it. Um, Amex Gold, I've kind of covered before. I, I think it can be a good card for some people because it earns 4X at restaurants and supermarkets, but it has a fairly high fee and the credits can be hard to use. So I'm not sure if that would directly recommend that as the best travel credit card. So this answer for ChatGP, I think is sort of a mixed, mixed bag. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. That I asked ChatGPT, um, which is what are the first five credit cards that someone new to travel hacking should get? This is a question I get often, like, well, how do I get into this thing? Okay, and my general advice before I go into what ChatGPT has to say is that you want to think carefully about opportunity cost and that, care um, and that careful analysis will inform the order in which you open these cards. Uh, because of the Chase 524 rule, it makes more sense to start with Chase, fill up those 524 slots, and then move on to other issuers so that you can get both the Chase cards and the other issuers cards. As opposed to starting with other issuers uh, and then locking yourself out of Chase for two years and then you're leaving a lot of value on the table. So that's why I usually ask people to start with Chase before they move on to other issuers like American Express. So let's see if ChatGPT has a similar idea. Uh, interestingly, the first card it recommended was the Chase Sapphire Preferred, and the second card it recommended was the Chase Freedom Flex, both of which I think are solid options. I actually think if you can get a Chase Freedom card as your first or second card, uh, whether the Freedom Flex or Freedom Unlimited, that's a very good stepping stone into the more lucrative Chase credit cards. Um, it also recommended the Venture card again, which again, I said is sort of not what I usually recommend. I prefer the Venture X. It also recommended the gold card again, as well as the City Premier. Now, I do think the City Premier card is a pretty solid option. Um, it earns 3x points on travel, hotels, dining, supermarkets, and gas stations. So pretty versatile. It has a pretty good signing sign-up bonus, usually anywhere from 60,000 to 80,000 points. And it has decent airline transfer partners, and it only costs $95. And it can group with other City cards to provide a, a sort of bifecta or trifecta setup. So uh, I do like the City Premier card. I don't know if I would get it as my first five. Well, maybe here. The tricky thing about City City is that since it's not subject to the 524 rule, I probably wouldn't use a 524 slot directly if I still have a lot of chase cards on the table. However, um, my anecdotal experience is that City is pretty picky with uh, their approvals for 
the premier card, especially if you have opened more than one card in the last six months. So, uh, you know, it may make sense to get it sort of early in your credit card strategy. Um, so I, I think those are, uh, those are pretty good answers. Uh, I would definitely not put Amex Gold, however, in the first five cards. Me personally, you know, again, although it has a solid 4x points on restaurants, supermarkets, Amex will basically approve anyone with decent credit down the line, even if you've already had a lot of cards. So I would save um, your first five cards for those more sensitive issuers like Chase or um you know, city depending. Capital One can be tricky if you've already had too many credit cards as well. So I, I think that recommendation is okay. So, you know, sort of mixed bag. Some answers I like, some answers I don't like. So uh, very interesting result there. Now, the next question I asked is what is the best way to use Chase Ultimate Rewards points? There's really only one correct answer to this question I feel pretty strongly about, and that is to transfer to partners um, transferring. So one Chase point can become one United Mile, for example, or one Southwest point, uh, one of the airline partners, or one Ca Air Canada Aeroplan point. Um, one Chase point can also become hotel points. It could become one World of Hyatt point, right? And and actually, ChatGPT says, number one, transfer to travel partners, best value. So I got it correct. Um, it also it mentions other methods, but it did have transfer partners as number one, and that is completely correct in my opinion. It even says World of Hyatt, arguably the best hotel transfer partner due to favorable redemption rates and high value properties. I think that is spot on. Um, you should only transfer Chase points um, to Hyatt for hotels. Never transfer to Marriott Bonvoy, uh, even though they have more properties. Their redemption rates usually cost three to four times as much as a higher redemption um, for the same kind of tier or value property. So definitely or of high, very good rec recommendation. Um, it highlights some airline partners like United, Southwest, Singapore, Air Canada, Aeroplan, and British Airways, Avios. Um, I, I like Aeroplan. I think it's a solid option. I personally would save more of my Chase points for World of Hyatt and use like my Amex points for Aeroplan. But uh, this is not an incorrect recommendation. I probably wouldn't transfer to United Mileage Plus or Southwest though, though because United has really devalued their miles and oftentimes it takes so many points to get a good redemption now. Now you could get good redemptions here and there in specific use cases. I'm not saying it's always useless, but that's not on the top of my mind of the best transfer partners for Chase. Uh, Southwest, you can definitely get more than one cent per point, which is great. But, um, you know, it's hard to get outside value. So I'm not sure if I would recommend those at the top. Um, and then number two, it recommends uh, you can book travel through the Chase Ultimate Rewards portal. And it, uh, ChatGPT says, with the reserve, you will get 1.5 cents per point. With the Sapphire Preferred or Inc. Preferred, you'll get 1.25 cents per point. That is very true. However, you can easily get two or more cents per point with World of Hyatt, whereas, you know, the reserve and preferred redemptions through the portal is a fixed cent per point. Can't really get outsized value. So Sean and I generally don't recommend using the portal. So, um, and then it talks about pay yourself back, combining points, which is correct. So overall, good answer in that it puts transfer partners up front, and which I believe is the objectively correct answer. Uh, but it also mentions the other options that I would not recommend. Moving on, I asked... What are the top five most important and valuable airline partnerships that a points and miles enthusiast should learn and use? And ChatGPT recommended uh, these five. Now, before I go into those, uh, the reason it's super important to learn airline partnerships is often because the best redemptions for a particular airline is frequently not through that very airline's own loyalty program, but by booking a partner award with a different um, airline to redeem for that flight. Um, for example, um, if I want to redeem for an EVA Air business class flight, um, one of the best ways to do that is through ANA, uh, which is another Star Alliance award. So I, you know, I'm not transferring points to EVA, I'm transferring points to ANA first and then using their program to book my EVA ticket. There are a bunch of different airline um, partnerships that you can learn about. So let's see what ChatGPT says the top five are. So first it says United Airlines and Star 
Alliance. United Airlines is part of the Star Alliance, the largest airline alliance. Uh, United Mileage Plus points are highly valuable for domestic and international travel. Okay, I think that's debatable. Um, Star Alliance is very valuable. However, I don't think United is necessarily the best program in terms of getting good value for, especially for premium class awards. They've just jacked up the prices over and over and over again, where I feel like I rarely ever transfer to them unless there's some very specific use case. Um, I think Air Canada Aeroplan's um, award chart is generally more reasonable and easy to use throughout. Uh, ANA also has very competitive redemption rates for its Star Alliance partners, though their program is more difficult to use and has a steeper learning curve. They have better redemption rates. I don't think United Airlines belongs on this top five list, so I'm a bit skeptical. Now, it does mention best uses includes United's excursionist perks. So JatGPT reminds us that it allows a free one-way flight within a multi-city itinerary when booking with United Miles. Now, if you can leverage that, I think it's a super great perk. But generally, I think their sadly their redemption rates are just no longer competitive, especially for international travels. So I would pass on that one. Let's see what other ones ChatGPT recommend. Oh, number two, American Airlines and One World. I think this is a very good answer. American Airlines miles are amazing in that they can provide very good outsized value on the top tier redemptions. Uh, for example, ChatGP notes a key partner is Japan Airlines, which has excellent premium cabin and economy flights for flights to and within Asia. That is correct. Um, a flight to Japan from the U.S. costs 60,000 points for business class or 80,000 points for first class, um, whereas United would charge way more points for that same redemption. Um, so I, I think American Airlines is awesome. It also mentions other key partners are Cutter, so you can get Q Suite and Business Class, a very good recommendation, ChatGPT, as well as Cathay Pacific, which is known for its first class product and connectivity in Asia. I agree with this recommendation. So American Airlines points, now they are kind of harder to earn since you really need their co-branded cards. They're not, they don't really transfer from any, um, uh, you know, major you know, credit card program, but, uh, I think it's a good option. Um, it also recommends Air Canada Aeroplan and Star Alliance. It says Air Canada's Aeroplan program is part of the Star Alliance and has become one of the most versatile programs thanks to its dynamic award charge, flexible points, and lack of fuel surcharges on many partner airlines. That is true. Aeroplan also allows mixed class redemptions and includes unique options like stopovers on one-way awards for just 5,000 points. That is also very true and a very good perk. Um, you know, stopovers only costing 5,000 points is amazing. Where, whereas, like, if you paid cash for some of these itineraries to piece together this extra stopover, um, it would cost you a lot more money. So this is great if you can find availability. Uh, name some key partners, including Swiss, Lufthansa, Turkish Airlines, popular for routes to Europe. That's correct. ANA, reliable option for flights to Japan. Uh, Eva Air, which I, I mentioned for flights to Asia in a premium cabin. And Etihad which actually was a very good redemption until its awards have become more difficult to book now. So I think Aeroplan does deserve to be on top five list. Now, my, my take on Aeroplan is they may not have the best award chart for every single type of route, but they are the most well-rounded program where I feel like I can get good value on a wide variety of um, a wide variety of airline redemptions, especially in premium cabin and uh, their points are not too hard to earn. They transfer from almost every major currency, so American Express, Capital One, uh, Chase, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, moving on, it talks about, uh, so number four, it says British Airways and Avios, and number five, Singapore Airlines, Chris Flyer, and Star Alliance. Um, I am a little skeptical of these answers, to be honest. I think Avios uh, can be valuable in certain redemptions, but it, it's really a specific use case, right? Like if I know on a fly cutter Q suites, obvious can be a very good redemption, but you know, is it a, you know, a program I would speculatively transfer to because I know I'll always be able to get value. No, I can't say that's the case. Uh, same thing with Singapore Airlines, Chris Flyer Star Alliance. Now capital, uh, or ChatGPT does qualify this and says, uh, Singapore Airlines is the only frequent flyer program with consistent access to Singapore Airlines' own premium cabins, including its legendary first-class suites. 
Now that is true. Uh, if you want to fly there, the very special Singapore Airlines first class, which is on my bucket list, but very hard to book with partners, you kind of do need to use their mileage program. But I would not, you know, really prefer Singapore Airlines as my main, you know, Star Alliance program because um, they often can charge a lot more points for these things. Okay, so. Again, another mixed bag. I think it had some good uh, recommendations, but you know, for some responses, I would probably say something else. Uh, okay, next question before we move on to the Holy Grail, the, the big rec personal recommendation. So I asked it, uh, I'm planning to travel more often and stay at more hotels. I'm also interested in leveraging credit cards to receive more benefits and earn free nights at hotels. Which hotel program would be the most valuable for me to become loyal to and why now of course uh, loyal listeners to this podcast will know that sean and i believe as of as things stand right now there's only one correct objective answer to this question we'll see if chat gpt uh, agrees with me now it, it sort of didn't directly answer my question i asked it for one specific hotel program and it gave me you know a overview of four but then it did tell me which of the four it thought was the most generous with its benefits so first i talked about world of hyatt uh, it says it has generous points redemptions very true offer some of the lowest points redemptions for award nights it is a program where i can consistently get more than two cents per point whereas with the other programs i can barely scrape by with one cent per point on most redemptions so i never transfer to them so, so that is correct uh, World of hyatt elite benefits uh, higher status levels like globalists offer free breakfast, club lounge access, suite upgrades, and wave resort fees on award stays. Completely agree. Hyatt has very consistent delivery benefits, unlike some other chains. It also talks about transferability. Hyatt is a one-to-one -one transfer partner with Chase Ultimate Rewards. And that is also a reason why I like World of Hyatt, because it's pretty easy to learn, earn tons of points with them, especially if you open the Chase Inc. business cards and transfer those Ultimate Rewards points into World of Hyatt points. So very good, strong start. Um, and it also recommends the World of Hyatt credit card. Great. And then it also recommends Marriott Bonvoy as number two and gives um, an overview of it. It also recommends Hilton Honors. I'm not going to read through everything it said because um, you've all heard it from us before. And that recommends IHG1 rewards. But then, the end, it says, Best Hotel Loyalty Program for Points and Miles Enthusiast. It says, For most Points and Miles Enthusiasts, World of Hyatt stands out as the most valuable program due to its favorable award chart, top-notch elite benefits, and transferability with Chase Ultimate Rewards points. Bingo. I think that is actually the correct answer. Um, there is no program like Hyatt that treats its um loyal members so well with the benefits in my personal opinion and your points are just so valuable beyond belief you can get crazy redemptions for astronomical cents per point sometimes and it makes a lot of vacations that have been out of reach for me financially possible so i i do like world of high i think this is a great answer However, it does, a chat GPT qualifies this and says, if flexibility and global reach are your main priorities, Marriott Bonvoy offers the broadest selection of properties. That is very true. Um, you know, Marriott Bonvoy does have uh, a broader, you know, array of properties than Royal Hyatt does has that big footprint. But to me, that can be a con sometimes uh, since they've expanded their footprint so quickly, I feel like their delivery of benefits is not as consistently rolled out to all these different properties. Uh, so what's a pro for someone, maybe a con for another person. And this is an example of that. Um, it also says Hilton Honors is also strong if you value easy elite status and higher end options like all inclusives or resorts with premium amenities. I think that is also a fair take. I do like all these chains for different reasons. I think Hilton is a good option um, to earn, you know, like you can get diamond status or top elite status with just a credit card, the Hilton Aspire card, super OP. Um, I also like Hilton's credit cards give these super valuable free night certificates that can be used at any standard room worldwide, including some of the most expensive properties like the Walter Pastorias and whatever. And it does correctly mention that it has um, a good higher end options. So um, I'm thinking of their Waldorf Astoria brand, which is considered very um, top tier. They also have Conrad and LXR, uh, which are very luxurious. We did have an episode on this earlier, so go check that out. So. I think this is a very good answer. Um, it correctly, objectively, in my 
sort of unbiased opinion, um, identified that Hyatt is the best option, hands down. But um, it also mentions some pros of the other chains that I agree with. Okay, so now I put it to the real test. So I asked it to give me very specific recommendations on my credit card situation because I'm looking to open a new card and I want, and I already have so many cards. So that takes a lot of options off the table. So I asked that I'm a credit card enthusiast who maximizes points and miles for travel. I'm looking to open some new credit cards because I have about $8,000 in upcoming spend that I would like to put toward a sign up bonus or bonuses. Recommend me five credit cards to consider based on my current situation. And then I gave it a list of all of the credit cards that I currently have. So it's kind of like 15 or so, kind of already an insane amount. Um, and I say, don't recommend me cards I already have. And then I, I sort of tested it. I said, I have opened five personal cards in the last 24 months, which is true. So we'll see if it knows the 524 rule and will prevent itself from recommending me any chase cards, which will be denied because of the 524 rule. Um, I said, give specific reasons for each recommendation and explain how it would fit into my overall credit cards rewards maximization strategy and how it might fill in any existing gaps in my current credit card collection. All right, let's see what five cards it recommended me. Um, first, the American Express Gold Card. Okay, it says uh, key benefits, the 4X points on dining and groceries, the dining credit, Uber cash credit, etc. cetera. Uh, offers a well, strong welcome bonus. Okay, and it says why it fits into your strategy, membership rewards, diversification. You currently don't have a way to earn Amex membership rewards, so this card would introduce a valuable new point currency to your portfolio. Okay, that is true. I do not currently have Amex cards. Uh, I have made my parents open a lot of them for our family strategy, but I currently have not gotten them. I do plan on getting them in the future. So I did correctly identify that diversifying points is very important. And I often emphasize this. Um, it's not really the best idea to put all your eggs in one basket. Like some people are like, oh, it's too complicated. I can only earn chase points. Otherwise my brain will explode. I have to mention if I have to manage capital one points and Amex points, but in my opinion, diversifying has so many benefits, including protecting yourself from devaluations for certain programs and giving you a broader array of access to more loyalty programs um, that sometimes certain credit card issuers just don't have. So uh, I do agree with its point about diversification. Now, uh, for reasons I say, I probably wouldn't keep the Amex Gold card long-term if I were to get it. Um, if I had a good bonus, um, I definitely consider it, and it generally does have good bonuses from what I've seen. But you know, the, cred the credits are to justify the annual fee are really annoying to use. I don't think I would benefit that much more from that 4x points on dining grocery compared to other many other cards give me 3x points on dining, like Chase Sapphire Reserve or the City Premier gives 3x points. So although you know I can earn more points from this, I have to deal with the annual fee. I have to deal with all these credits. Amex called. Okay, uh, sort of a mid recommendation. I'll put it that way. Okay, let's see what else it recommended me. Number two, City A Advantage Platinum Select World Elite MasterCard. Okay, I think this is a good recommendation. And I like that it was sort of now thinking out of the box, probably because uh, I already knocked many options off the table by telling it all the cards I had told me not to recommend it and told it not to recommend me any of those cards. Um, and honestly, for this card, the only benefit I care about is the welcome offer um, because American Airlines miles are hard to get from because they're they don't they're not really transfer partner of anything as I said but they're so valuable you can fly to Japan with just 80,000 miles which is pretty much just one sign up bonus so funny thing is I did apply for this card earlier uh recently and I got denied so um I took an L on that one but uh, Apparently, it's smart enough to know that I did consider this card or would consider it because I did. Okay, next uh, uh, next one. Capital One Venture X rewards credit card. Okay, I, yeah, I mentioned this card earlier. It's awesome. Only $395 annual fee, $300 annual travel credit plus 10,000 anniversary miles automatically covers the annual fee every year. It gives you priority pass lounge access with free authorized users so they can all get their lounge access. I think this is an awesome card. And, and I like that it gives you 2x points on all your purchases as well, which is quite competitive multiplier. Now, um, 
I would consider getting this card. I do not currently have the Venture X, but I'm not confident that would get approved since I already had so many cards in a short time span. And my understanding is that Capital One has a pretty tricky, um, you know, pretty tricky approval algorithm where it's not just based on your credit worthiness, but like how profitable they think you are based on how many cards you've opened. So, you know, if I can get approved for this, great, but I have a hunch it might be harder. I should wait longer. Um, but I think that's a good recommendation, nonetheless. Okay, next recommendation, Amex Business Gold Card. Okay, this is a strange recommendation. Now, I do like that it is recommending me business cards uh, because those do come with very generous sign-up bonuses. Um, you know, the Business Gold Card, the main draw is that it earns 4x points on two categories um, like airfare, advertising, gas, dining, shipping, um, and flexible for business use. Now, I do think if I had a big business with a lot of spend on these categories, of course, this card is super worth it. Even with the fairly high annual fee, I think it's something like 350 now. So, um, good option in that sense. But for me, you know, I think with the high fee, the four, you know, it's not enough for this card to have like the 4x points for me. And I think... I might get, you know, this is another one where I might get it for the bonus and then get rid of it the following year. So, um, yeah, interesting recommendation. Not what I would have thought of because, you know, I like to try to get cards that I know will keep long term um, rather than just for the bonus. But this is a card where I would definitely not keep long term unless I had that huge spend. Okay, and then number five, it recommended me the Built World Elite MasterCard, which is a personal card. Uh, key benefits are 1x points on rent payments with no fee, 3x on dining, and 2x on travel, and it has very solid transfer partners, including American, United, and Hyatt, which ChatGPT correctly mentions. Now, if you are a loyal listener of this podcast, you will know I have super mixed feelings about the built card, um, which I have a whole episode about. This is personally not a card I will be getting in the near future. And the main reason is that there is no sign-up bonus on this card. Okay, so um, I sort of disagree with ChatGPT's recommendation. Of course, it's super nice that you can earn 1x points on rent payments with no fee. And that's one of the main draws of the card. But realistically, you know, how many how many points are you going to get from that, right? Like, let's say your rent, let's say even if your rent is expensive, like $3,000 a month, Okay. Um, so each year you're going to be paying uh, $36,000. You get 36,000 points from this, which is barely even close. It's not even close to like a sign-up bonus of 60,000 to 80,000 points that you can just get from signing up for another card. And then even if you have a, to pay a fee to pay your rent or other expenses, it's still worth it. Get that much bigger bonus than like using this card for a whole year and barely getting enough points f for any meaningful redemption. Um, so because it does not have a welcome offer, um, I would not recommend the built card for myself. Uh, so unfortunately, I will have to disagree with ChatGPT's recommendation to me. So um, overall, let's let's wrap this up. Um, let's wrap this episode up. I think you know Ch ChatGPT is certainly knowledgeable about credit cards, and it definitely has information in its training data to discuss these issues in a competent way. However, I would really strongly recommend that you talk to other people who are experienced in this area and not just follow its advice. If you weren't super familiar with credit card points and strat you know, miles strategy, you know, I come from a more advanced perspective on how I want to optimize my cards. So, you know, as you can tell, I disagreed with some of these recommendations and, um, because it, it didn't make sense for me or would it be something I would personally recommend. But, you know, it can be a good... You know, useful tool to help you brainstorm some things with about you know what credit card strategies to look into or what cards to consider it but personally i would not be replacing it or using it to um, make my decisions for me so this does mean that i will not be replacing sean my co-host with ai and, um, and we hope to see him back again when he is back from his travels okay so 
Hopefully you enjoyed today's uh, sort of different vibe episode. Let me know if you enjoy today's content if you want to hear more similar things like this. Um, so leave us a comment down below. Uh, do you use ChatGPT for credit card stuff? Uh, has it worked for you? I'm very curious to hear about your experiences. Uh, if you find today's video useful, uh, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our channel. It greatly supports us. You have no idea. And then also, if you are interested in signing up for a credit card, please consider using one of our referral links down in the description below. It greatly helps support this channel. And finally, if you want to collect, connect with other like-minded individuals who are passionate about credit cards and travel, please check out the completely free, we're not trying to sell you anything, uh, completely free Discord server link down in the description below. Uh, you'll learn a ton if you go on there. So thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.